And we're live, people. How are we doing out there? How are we doing? Good to see ya. Good to see you out there. Welcome on in. Are we dealing with blurry early camera again? Looks good. People, we got two more days left. Two more days left together, then uh, I'm not going to see you guys for, for quite a long time, right? So let's finish strong. Let's finish strong here. And, and people, we, we've done an incredible job, if you really think about it. We have learned a lot in a very, very short period of time, which is awesome. Along that same point, um, some of you guys have completed the test already, I've noticed. A few of you. A lot, a lot of you guys have like, like 70, 80% of the questions done. And um, you're like kind of trying to figure out the last couple ones. I like that, right? But overall, the scores look pretty good. The scores look pretty good, which is really, really cool. I'm really, really happy about that. So, you know, amidst everything, we're still learning. We're st still learning at a high level. AP macroeconomics. Sensational. You guys like my new house here in LA? It's pretty nice. Moved away from the beach house. Now we're here. But it's nice, right? All right, people, your attendance in the chat today is, um, oh yeah, your favorite place to eat in Grand Blanc, in GB. Your favorite place to eat in GB, or like nearby area, it doesn't have to be in GB. It could be like in Flint or Fenton or wherever, right? Could be, could be wherever, like locally though, like a place I could like just drive to and, and, and go to. Your favorite place to eat, could be like takeout, could be like dine in. What's your favorite place to eat at? Welcome on in. 27. We're missing a couple people. We're missing a couple people right now. This attendance in the chat's gonna be big. Who's, who's gonna get that big tardy today? What's going on here? Ooh. Fenton House. Man, I have, actually, I haven't really been to Fenton House much. I go to Fen House sometimes for um, for like pizza. You just get takeout though. To uh, Italian Gardens, Little Joe's, Fenton Fire Hall. I missed the first couple. Black Rocks. I've never been to Black Rock. I feel like I don't want to cook if I'm going out to eat, sort of thing. But I know the experience probably is pretty cool. Big John's is pretty good. I'm not gonna lie. Culver's. Um, Bagger Dave shut down. Oh, Bagger Dave's is pretty cool. They would uh, support us teachers quite often. Um, Fenton Fire Hall, the laundry. Kennedy's, uh, you know, Fenton traveler. Pretty good. I, I like I like both. Um, I haven't gone there in a long time though. Obviously since COVID, but uh, the laundry's really good. The Fenton Fire Hall is really good too. I like I like the Fenton Fire Hall in, in, in the winter time more than anything. Um, no, they're telling gardens. I've never been there before. Kidoba. Kidoba's pretty good. Kidoba's pretty good. Uh, Olive Garden, Little Joe's, Panera, Bangkok Peppers, ooh, Panera's, all these are good. The Grafted Root, I've never been there. Is that in Flint? The Grafted Root, I feel like I've heard about it. Um, Olive Garden, Sagano's, Panera, Panera does rock. Ichiban's pretty good. I, I, if I like sushi though, I'm going to travel down to Brighton and go to um, Sushi Zen. I think that place has the best sushi I even might like Sagano's over here at Ichiban, but I haven't been to Ichiban in a long time, so I, I'm not 100%, you know, I don't know, 100% about, you know, how good their, their quality of food is, but Black Rock, Bangkok Peppers, Little Joe, Sagano's, oh man, you guys are making me hungry, you're making me hungry. Happy birthday, Sophie, from me and Lydia. Yeah, it's Sophie's birthday today, Sophie Curtis, shout out. I need to do a thing where like I, I gather up all your birthdays, it'd be pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. Um, cool. Is that everybody? Is that everybody? Everyone's responding. We only got 28, and I'm one, I'm one of them. We got some people absent. I'm gonna have to really thoroughly go through um, the attendance in the chat here. All right. Um, okay. Let's look on uh, what we need to do today. All right. A couple announcements, right? So I hope you guys are checking your problem sets. I really, really hope you're checking your problem sets each and every day, right? Make sure you check problem set 2.1 today. Like it's, it, you're not gonna learn much, right? If, 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 if you try your hardest on your problem set, right? And then like you just never check your answers and see if you know you're, you know it or you don't know it sort of thing. So make sure you're checking your problem set as always. 
Uh, remember, problem set 2.2 will be due tonight. Um, that is what we did yesterday. That's that GDP one, which, which could have been kind of challenging. Again, if you miss questions, that's not that big of a deal. The, the most important thing is that you're going back and you're, you're, you're rechecking your work, okay? Also, I'm kind of behind a little bit in grading. I'm not going to lie. So I'm going to have to return some of your problems so you, so you can, you know, change it, right? Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll obviously do that this weekend. Your, your, your grade's going to be 100% accurate as of Monday, right? I'm going to have all your problem sets in, and I'm going to have all, I'm, I'm, all, I'm going to have your one test in. Um, so, yeah, your grade will be sitting, um, like, clean on, on, on Monday, all right? Um, obviously, 2.2 is due tonight. I just said that. You don't want tests is due Friday night at midnight. People, like you have to turn it in by Friday night. You have to. Oh my gosh. Um, turn my phone off. If you turn your test in, in after Friday night, we're gonna have some big issues. That's that's a big no-no, all right? You're, you're turning it in like after like like the course ends, sort of. Like I know it's like three different intervals, but make sure that test is in by Friday night, right? Or else you're gonna have a big goose egg in the summative category, which is 80% of your grade, right? I can't stress how important that, that is to turn your test in. And I also can't stress how important it is to not cheat on that test, right? If I see comparable test scores, right, uh, or I hear I get wind about uh, students uh, potentially cheating, bad news bears, okay? You don't need to cheat, people. You, you have notes. You have resources all around you. It should be the easiest test you've ever taken in your life. So uh, what are we going to learn about today? We're going to learn about unemployment. We're going to learn about unemployment. Can you calculate the unemployment rate? Can you calculate the labor force? Can you calculate the labor force participation rate? And then we're going to learn about the different types of unemployment. Um, unemployment is a pretty big, big, big idea, right? Unemployment is what generally is used and what is mentioned and what you guys um, referred to um, when you guys were like, you know, when, when I asked you, what is the state of the economy right now? You guys are like, it's bad because unemployment's high, right? And generally, unemployment is, is, is a pretty strong measure of, of, of economic health, right? But we need to really understand what is the unemployment rate saying, right? How do we calculate the unemployment rate and what are some biases with that unemployment rate? Is it understated, is it overstated? And is all unemployment necessarily bad? And is low unemployment necessarily good, right? It's, it's a lot of stuff we need to look at here in a second. Overall, I don't think the notes will take too long today. I, th I think I say that every day, but I don't think it'll take too long today. Um, so yeah, and then tomorrow we're gonna learn about inflation, right? And then obviously uh, when we come back, Three weeks from now, we're, we're going to revisit sort of uh, GDP, inflation, and unemployment. We're going we're to re sort of visit all three of those, and I'll probably give you a problem set that looks similar to all three uh, problem sets. You're not going to get a problem set tomorrow. After class tomorrow, you're done, right? If you already turned your test and you, and you, and you finished your problem set today, boom. I just want you to pay attention tomorrow. We'll be good to go, right? I'm not going to assign you work um, like class ends on Friday sort of thing, okay? Okay. Um, are you guys ready? Are you ready out there? Let's do it. Let's do it. I think I shared all the announcements I need to share. I am ready to tackle the concept of unemployment. Okay? Let's get out your notebook and your pencil. And let's get after it. Let's get after it here. Okay. Wow, you guys are all like friends in real life. Look at that. Happy birthday, Sophie. Happy birthday. That's pretty cool. All right. Okay. In real life. Um, all right, so uh, going back to this, right, I can measure the health of the economy. Again, we're econ doctors, and we're, we're trying to learn about the diseases. That way, at some point, we can diagnose a poor macroeconomic health, and we can ultimately fix it using either fiscal or monetary policy. So we're through the first disease, the disease of slow economic growth, okay? How do we measure economic growth? GDP changes from one year to the next, right? Adjusting for inflation, that is real GDP. We use real GDP to do that. Now, we're gonna try to figure out is how do we calculate the unemployment rate, right? What we need to do is we need to identify and narrow down the unemployment rate to, to specifically look at the cyclical unemployment rate. So, a couple steps we need to, do to tackle first is how do you calculate the unemployment rate? What is the unemployment rate com composed of, right? What, what does labor force mean? And what does it mean truly to be unemployed? And then what are the different types of unemployment? And then afterwards, we're going to calculate the cyclical unemployment rate using something called the natural rate of unemployment. So we're going to get there. And obviously, starting tomorrow, we're going to about inflation. 
I don't think we're going to get to CPI tomorrow. I just want to kind of touch on like what is inflation. I want to touch on real interest rates because that's really important just for like life, right? Like interest rates, right? Buying a car, buying a house, and and what does a real interest rate look like? And if inflation occurs or deflation occurs, are you better off as the lender or the borrower? And in, in either situations, so we're going to talk about tomorrow. Tomorrow's session should be pretty fun. We're, I'm going to save that one for Friday. This one's really fun too. Actually, real talk, as the kids say. This is probably one of my most favorite uh, things to uh, lecture about is unemployment. So let's do it, people. Goal number two, limit unemployment, right? So obviously we know the Great Depression, massive unemployment, uh, all-time high, right? 25% unemployment, one out of every four Americans was trying to find a job, and they could not find a job. They were actively seeking work, and they could not find work. Uh, I think the Great Great Recession, we, we I think we got up to like 12%, right? Um, maybe higher in other areas, but I think like in national nationally we're like twelve percent. Um, and then after two thousand eight, steadily just went down, 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 all the way to five percent, and then it went too low and went down like three percent. We'll talk about that more in here in a bit. And now I want to say the unemployment rate's like between like six, seven percent ish. But there's a lot of problems with calculating the unemployment rate right now. There's a lot of complexities with with with, with looking at that right now. We'll discuss that too. Okay, so first. What does it mean to be unemployed, right? Like if your friend's like, hey, I'm unemployed right now. Are you, right? What does it mean to be unemployed? Uh, to be unemployed means you are actively searching for work. You've actively applied for jobs. You've sent out resumes in the last three months uh, and you can't find work. That's what it means to be unemployed. If you're not actively seeking work, you're not unemployed, all right? The government, in other words, does not categorize it. They do not count you as, as an unemployed person, all right? So like... If you're just in college and you're, you're not, you know, trying to find a job, you're not unemployed, right? If you're, you know, in high school right now, like, you're not, you're not unemployed um, if, if you're not actively seeking work. And a couple other criteria we have to talk about. Like, it, it, and, and say you look for a job for, for a long time, right? You look for a job for, like, three four months. You can't find a job. You give up trying to find a job, right? And then, you like, you just move in to your parents' basement, right? Although you're not working, your parents might give you a hard time and be like, hey, you're, you know, unemployed. Come on. You're not actually unemployed because you're not actually actively seeking work, the vocab word, that is called a discouraged worker. One, it's a worker that's discouraged, right? But like, that's what they're called, right? That's what the government identifies them as, a discouraged worker. A discouraged worker is one that act, uh, that looked for a job, couldn't find a job, and now is given up looking for a job. They're not uh, counted as unemployed, they're, they're counted as a discouraged worker, okay? So generally, the unemployment rate is understated. It's understated. So the unemployment rate generally is like 5%. In actuality, it probably is a little bit higher, right? It's probably like 6 7%, maybe 8%, okay? Because a lot of people look for work and they, they give up searching for work for a little bit until, you know, you know they, they open up the, the, the search process again. So generally, in, in total, the unemployment rate is generally understated, okay? All right. So the unemployment rate... The percent of people in the labor force who want a job but are not working. All right, so now let's calculate the unemployment rate, right? The amount of people that are actively seeking work that can't find work, okay? So that would be um, what is required is, is to identify the labor force, right? Who, who are the people that we're actually going to count, right? So what does it mean to be in the labor force? Oh, no, what is, what's going on here? That looks terrible. Oh, no, i got to move the whole box. Good. All right, before we get to... To that, we need to talk about who is in the labor force. Who are the people we're actually going to count? And then of those people, um, who are trying to find a job that can't find a job, right? So, so in order to be counted as employed or unemployed, either two, right? Just to simply be counted as a member in the labor force or participant in the labor force, one, you have to be 16 years and up, right? So if you're 15 and you're trying to find a job, I think you can legally work in Michigan. Um, uh, if you're 15, I'm pretty sure it's like 14 and so many months, but you got to get like a work permit from the school. It might have changed since, since I was in, um, since I was young back in my day. But um, yeah, you, yeah, if you're 15 and you're trying to find a job, you're not unemployed. If you're 15 and you're working, you're not employed either, right? You're just not counted as the labor force, even though if you're looking for a job or you're working, you're just not counted in the labor force, right? You're not, you're not over 16, right? The whole the whole idea of, 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 of narrowing down this labor force, the people that we actually want to count is again, we want to measure economic health. We want to get a good indicator on, on where we're at. We don't want to count people that are 14, right? We want to count people that are 15, right? They're, they're too young. They're, they shouldn't be in the labor force. They shouldn't be working, right? So if they're searching for work, it's not really reflective of a poor economy. You're supposed to be in school, right? Learning stuff, right? Then at some point you enter into the labor force. 
Um, number two, you must be able and willing to work, obviously, to be accounted in the labor force. You, you either are going to be like trying to work or, 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 or medically able to work, right? You'd be like disabled, right? Um, you can't be institutionalized. You can't be in prison or in the hospital. So if you're in prison uh, and you're like, you're like, I want a job, and like you're trying to find a job right in prison, right? You're just, you're just not counting the labor force, right? If you're if you're, if you're, in, you're hospitalized, in, in hospital hos- hospitalized, right? You're not counting the labor force. If you're in the military. You're not counting the labor force, even if you're like you know your military that the military is your employer, right? You're just not counting the labor force. We're not trying to count. People that really can't work, or in a situation where like they could lose their job or, or not, right? Like, it just we're we're trying to look at like just like a, a normal American sort of thing. And in other countries, right, generally follow these these same uh, calculations for their, their labor force and, and how they calculate their unemployment rates. So it says, why is a stay-at-home dad or a mom not counted as unemployed? I kind of feel like a stay-at-home dad with, with my dog here. I'm always home now. I don't I don't think I've driven my car at all like in weeks, but. Um, they're not counted as unemployed because if you're staying home and, and, and you're, you're maintaining the family, are you actively seeking work? No, you're not, right? I mean, it is a good thing, right? Stay home mom, all my stay home moms out there, all my stay home dads out there, shout out to you. You're doing a good thing, right? It doesn't mean, you know, the, and that's, that's why we don't want to count you, right? We don't want to count you as unemployed because you're not actively seeking work, right? So that, that's the idea. Um, so there's the unemployment rate right there. Unemployment rate is equal to the number of people unemployed over the number of people in the labor force, right? So how many people in the labor force are trying to find a job and can't find a job over the total amount of people in the labor force times 100 um, to move the decimal two spaces, and that would be our unemployment rate, okay? A couple other calculations you need to find is like like generally like, uh, you know, we talk about who's in the labor force, but given certain information you're gonna see here in a second, how do you identify labor force? You just you just you just add employed plus unemployed, right? Because if you're in the labor force, you're either one of two things: you're either working or you're trying to find work, right? So just look at the total amount of people unemployed plus the total amount of uh, total amount of people employed. That's going to be equal to your labor force. Lastly, the last uh, calculation, the last equation that you need to know is something called the labor force participation rate. Basically, it is the idea of, of all the adult population, right? All the uh, Americans that are over 16, um, how many of those people um, are employed or unemployed? How many people are participating in our economy, right? Who are, who are trying to work or are currently working, right? So, you know, that, that's the general idea. I think, I think the U.S. labor for participation rate is like 60 to 70%, I want to say. Between 60 and 70%. I want to say I could be I could be drastically off. Someone should look it up and then and put it in the chat. The U.S. labor force participation rate out of all adult Americans, right? Um, how many people are in the labor force, right? So we're not going to count the elderly, right? We're not going to count, um, you know, people that are, aren't in the labor force. Um, so, yeah, of, of how many Americans that are adults, how many are actively participating in the labor force is, is the idea of the labor force participation rate. Okay, so three calculations you need to know how to do. And we're going to put it to the test right here, right here, right? So it says labor market data for country X in millions of persons. Based on the information in the table above, what is the unemployment rate for country X? First, let's do this. Because I only give you one multiple choice question. Let, let's do all three of those calculations, right? So what is, um, what is the labor force here? What is the labor force here? How many people are working or are trying to find work. What is the labor force here? In millions. What is the labor force here? Who are the people that we're trying to count, right? The people that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to measure economic health from, right? Like, you're either working or you're trying to find work, right? So it'd be 100 million here. It'd be 100 million, 94 plus six, 100 million. And since that's your denominator, when you're calculating unemployment rate, that better be an easy number because on the AP test, unless it's virtual this year again, you can't use a calculator, right? So like, I would automatically just like cross out 6.38%. If I can't use a calculator and, and this, if this is the number, there's no way they would have you do that. Six point, so get 6.38% out of here. The labor force is 100, okay? 94 people are working, six people are trying to find work but can't. That's the labor force, those that are working and those that are trying. So 100 is our labor force. Let's do unemployment rate next. 
So unemployment rate is the amount of people unemployed over the labor force, which we, are, we, we already identified. So the amount of people unemployed is six, right, over the labor force, which is 100, right? So that'd be 6%. The answer is 6%. That's the unemployment rate. So just know that when we calculate the unemployment rate, we, as like the, the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, they only count certain people. They don't count every American in, 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 in the economy, right? We're not trying to see is there, how many people are working in the U.S. That's not the unemployment rate. It, it's, it's of the people in the labor force that we're, that we're trying to count, of those people, how many people are actively seeking work. In this case, in this example, it's 6%. The last one we look at is um, labor force participation rate, right? So that is labor force, which is 100, which we already identified here, over adult population. Now, if, you, if it doesn't say adult population, doesn't specify, then, then just assume population is the adult population. But sometimes it'll say population, then it'll also say adult population. We'll use the adult population in that case. But in this case, we only, we're only given one population. We're gonna assume that that's the adult population. So in this case, it'd be 100 over 180. 100 over 180. I need my calculator for that. Some of you guys might be able to do that in your head. I can't do that. 100 divided by 180. Again, labor force participation rate is labor force, 100 over the amount of people in the, the adults, right? So that'd be 55.5%, like 56%. So 56% of Americans that are that are of working age over 16 are, are participating. They're either working or they're trying to find work is the idea, okay? Hey, whoever our late person is, you better put your tennis in the chat. You better put your tennis in the chat. I'm watching you. I see you, okay? All right, so yeah, hopefully you can do those three calculations, all right? Next, what we're gonna talk about is is what are the different types of, uh, of unemployment? Not all unemployment's bad, right? And that's, you know, what most Americans believe, right? When Americans believe or, you know, see or they hear the unemployment rate is, say, 6%, they're like, wow, 6%. 6% of Americans can't find work. Well, no, if they're a little bit more educated, they'd be like, okay, 6% of the labor force can't find work. Well, some of that's not all bad, right? Some of that's not all bad. Some unemployment actually is, is fine. It's good, right? And we're talking about that here right now. All right, so the first type of unemployment is an unemployment that all of you guys are going to encounter in your life. All of you guys, myself included, at some point in your life, I already have been, has, has been frictionally unemployed. You've experienced frictional unemployment. What does frictional unemployment mean? Frictional unemployment simply means you, you're, you're between jobs. You're between jobs, right? Or you're entering the labor force for the first time, which is gonna be all of you guys pretty soon here. That's simply what frictional unemployment uh, means. Temporary unemployment for being uh, or being between jobs. The whole point is you have the skills necessary, right? So say you graduate college uh, and, and you studied in like accounting, right? And you're, you're trying to become an accountant, right? So you're unemployed for a little bit, right? Like not a lot of people graduate college and like, like the next day they're like at their place of employment. Generally, it takes a little bit, right? It takes time for you to find the right place, right? The, the, the right working environment for you, right? The location and, and pay and, and benefits and all that. And it takes time for the employer to find the right person for the job, you, right? So there's, there's some lag time. There's some time that takes to, to find a job. And that's what frictional unemployment means. You have the skills necessary, right? You, you have the credentials. You have the, the experience and the education to get your job. You're just not employed right now because of time. Right, so um, you could be frictional unemployed for a lot of reasons, right? Again, you could be entering the labor force for the first time, right? After high school, maybe you're, you're trying to find a job or maybe after high school or after college. Uh, wait, hold on, did I say full-time student? Did I not say full-time student? Oh, not in the military, not in school full-time. Don't forget that, or a or, or retired person, okay? So yeah, again, if you're in college full-time, you're, you're taking above 12 credit hours a semester, you're not, you're not counted as unemployed. All right. So again, high school, college. If you're, if you're a full-time student, you're not counted as unemployed. So, yeah, when you gra when you graduate high school, you're unemployed unless you go straight to college, right? When you graduate college, you're unemployed. Again, frictionally unemployed. Um, say you get your first job and you don't like it, so you quit. You're frictionally unemployed. You have the skills necessary. You just didn't like it, or even if you got fired for whatever reason. It, as long as the reason you got fired wasn't because they they couldn't afford you, right? Then you're you're frictionally unemployed, right? If like you got fired because like I don't know, you said something bad or, I don't know, like uh, you're working at McDonald's and, you know, you threw uh, Sprite at somebody, right, because you got mad at a customer. I don't know. Whatever, whatever the reason is, right? You had the skills necessary. Well, maybe not in that case. Customer service is, is pretty poor. But um, you're frictionally unemployed, right? You're fired. You left. 
you're entering the labor force for the first time, you're simply unemployed, you have the skills necessary, the transferable skills, you're just unemployed, okay? Seasonal unemployment is, is, is a subcategory within frictional unemployment, so there's gonna be three types, there's kind of four types, but we're gonna say three types. We're gonna say seasonal unemployment is, is within frictional unemployment, but that is when people are unemployed due to the season, right? So maybe you're like a professional lifeguard, you're really good at life, lifeguarding. In the wintertime, are you gonna have a job? Unless you work at a pool, no. You know, maybe you, you're a professional ski patrol person. Are you gonna work, be working in the summertime? No, right? Unless, I don't know, you're like in Alaska or something like that. Some people are unemployed just because of the season. Again, frictional unemployment and seasonal unemployment, is this reflective of poor economic health? No, right? People are just simply between jobs. Um, seasonal unemployment, people are unemployed just because of the season, right? When the season turns around, they're gonna be employed again. Is the, is the general idea. So we, we need to categorize and identify the types of unemployment because not all unemployment's bad, right? In this case, un, this unemployment's good. I would say when you have frictional unemployment in a country, that's a good thing, right? I think countries where like your job is given to you at birth, right? Like think about like, you know, like the Soviet Union like back in the day, it's probably not a good thing. It's probably not very efficient uh, use of our resources, right? But think about um, like a true command economy, right? A true economy that that um, the government controls all the factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, right? Like if you're born right when you come out of the womb, they're like, this person's gonna be a plumber, right? In that kind of country, right, you you will have 0% unemployment. You, you will have no one between jobs because like you have one job and you're gonna be working that job forever. You can't really get fired, right? So frictional unemployment is fine, it's good, and we need to identify that so if the unemployment rate is 6%, what we need to figure out is of that 6%, how many people are frictionally unemployed? How many people are unemployed due to like just reasons that are natural? Okay, we'll talk more about that here in a sec. The second type of unemployment is my favorite. And I don't mean it's my favorite, like I don't wanna be unemployed due to this reason, but it's fascinating. A lot of Americans, and a lot of Americans especially right now, are experiencing structural unemployment. Structural unemployment is when you, you get replaced by automation, you get replaced by technology, you get replaced by robots, is the idea. And it's gonna happen more and more as years go on. You know, think about the person that used to be like a milkman, right? In the neighborhood I live, that the, I live in like a 1950s sort of neighborhood, like really old, like ranch style homes. Like lower class, middle class, lower class probably more so. And um, some of the houses have like the, the little thing, like the, the lever where you open it up and like the person puts the milk in, right? It's pretty crazy. It's like the houses still have it here. Uh, but that person obviously lost their job at some point because uh, people just went to the grocery store and they just didn't have a need, uh, you, know, to, you know, to have the, the milk person drive it around. You know, think about like the VHS repairman, right? You know, a person specializing in repairing, you know, old VHSs or uh, VCRs or anything like that, right? That person is, is unemployed because DVDs, right, came out. And now even if you're a DVD repair person, like, you've been replaced too, right? This, like, this PowerPoint's almost so old, just, like, within, like, 10 years. Um, you know, now everything's streaming online. So, like, you know, DVDs. If you're working in the DVD industry, you're, you're done. You know, Radio Shack is pretty much done. People just use Amazon, right? Um, there's a lot of structural unemployment. I'm going to show you a bunch of examples um, here. But basically, it's the idea that, that you... you you lost your job because you don't have the skills necessary to produce that good or service at the, the cost that's appropriate uh, for the firm, right? Think about like self-checkout machines at a grocery store, right? You had the skills necessary, right? Like your skills were in demand, right? Customer service, like, you know, counting, you know, uh, change, right? Um, knowing how to like scan and bag goods and things like that. Now you're displaced because of self-checkout machines. Right, you know, uh, VGs or you know Kroger or whoever can can use those self checkout machines at a lower cost than you. Um, so now you need to you know go increase your human capital elsewhere, right, in order to find another job. You, you lost the transferable skills, and some jobs never come back. And unfortunately, a lot of Americans are going to experience that. And maybe myself, right? Um, you know, will school ever be the same? I don't know. We'll see. I hope so. I really hope so. I hope so very soon too. I hope I can see you guys soon, but. You know, you never know, right? Maybe, um, you know, some teachers are, are let go and, and instead of having eight econ teachers, there's one, right? And it's all online, right? We, we never know, right? Some people are just gonna get replaced by structural unemployment. So I'm gonna show you some examples here and now another vocab word for you, technological unemployment is more specific. Again, it's, it's a category within structural unemployment. That means you're replaced solely because of technology, right? And you see that a lot of jobs. My dad was working a job once and um, 
basically training came up or was like, hey, you know, you want to do this training? We're about to get these machines, and if you do the training, you know, um, the training's all about how to fix the machines if they break down. Well, luckily he did the training, and my dad's a minimum wage worker. He, did, he does not make a lot of money. He's, it, you know, it's like a eleven dollar job at the time. Now he's like a custodian sort of thing. Um, but good thing he did the training because after the training and after they got the machines, like twenty five percent of the workforce got laid off, right? But he got kept because he has human capital a little bit to fix the machines, so they kept them. So it's it's pretty crazy, right? Automation definitely, technology definitely displaces jobs. So here's some pictures I took. Um, I didn't really ask for these uh, these people's permission, so maybe YouTube will ban me. But this was a uh, uh, a McDonald's in Florida, and you, you see a lot of McDonald's have these like kiosk uh, inside, right? It's just it's just funny. I was sitting here in this McDonald's in, in Florida, and there's a there's a kid back here. He's cleaning the coffee maker because he's trying to make himself busy. He's trying to like look like you know, you know, keep me right. I I have the human capital. I have the skills necessary. Like I, I'm 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 needed. But even though there was a person standing right behind the cash register, these two gentlemen chose to go to the kiosk instead. And what's funny is they they could not figure out how to get free water on there, right? Like just a cup of like McDonald's water, like it's free. So they they had to go ask the manager. The manager comes out here and helps him, even though this kid's just like, I can help you guys. It'll probably be quicker, right? But you know, I'm, you know, a lot of people are in, in the fast food industry and in all industries are getting you know displaced by things like that. Um, you know, again, self checkout machines. I, I was playing like an adult flag football league uh, for a little bit, probably like four or five years ago, and like it's like late, like like the game started like nine, ten p.m. Whatever, beside the point. So we went to you know get some food and whatnot after the the game. It's like eleven o'clock, and there was one person working, and she's like, "Why are you taking a picture? Like, <laughs> like there's nothing to see here, right?" And I was like, "No, I'm just taking it for class, you know, on um, you know self checkout machines, whatever." And I was like, "How many people used to be working at this the, the, this this time, like the, during the shift?" And she said, three people used to be working. Now it's just one, right?" So the self checkout machines, once they got those installed, it it people lost their jobs, right, is, is the idea. And she, she's like, I, you know, selfishly, I like it, right, because it's easier. I don't have to, like, talk to people and, like, I can just, you know, monitor and make sure there's no theft and stuff. But, um, yeah, like, people lose their jobs due to automation all the time. And like, think about, like, Redbox, right? People lost their jobs. Netflix, you know, people that work for Redbox probably lost their jobs. Um, so here is some more examples. Um, and we're going to do this challenge, people. I don't know if you're following me on Twitter. You don't have to. But if you want to earn one extra credit sum at a point, one extra credit sum at a point, it's, it's kind of a lot. It's kind of a lot if you really think about it because, like, your test is, what, 30-some questions? So, like, you're kind of getting one question for free. If you would like to do the challenge, this is the Structural Unemployment Challenge. We usually do more challenges in the classroom setting because it's more fun and I have more dollars. Um, it's like a classroom currency, but I don't know if we're going to be able to do it this year. But... Um, this, this is how to get the, the extra credit sum at a point. You got to tweet at me and hashtag structural unemployment and hashtag anything else you want, you want to put on there. Um, if you see structural unemployment in real life in grand blank, try not to find a picture off the internet, right? Um, some students do. And if it's really good, I, I, I still give you a point, but I want you to, I want you to find real life structural unemployment. Um, it's harder now. Like if you have to use it, if you have to use the internet now, it's fine. I really don't want you like going out risking getting COVID to to, to get it one sum at a point. Um, but like if you're out and about doing sports, at, you know whatever, you, you're gonna, you're probably gonna notice something. You're probably gonna notice some sort of structural unemployment. So you find them off the internet, it's fine. But make sure it's really good and make sure it's not one of these examples. You can't repeat any of these examples. Okay. All right. So um, yeah, the movie theater in Brighton. I usually go to the movie theater in Brighton because like I don't want to go to the movie theater in Grambling because you guys are all there and um, you know separate work from life sort of thing. Um, so I go to the movie theater in Brighton and, um, yeah, like you can just walk up to the kiosk and, you know, get your movie ticket there. I used to work at that movie theater in Brighton, actually. That was my first job. Um, and you know, I'm sure some workers got laid off. I'm sure they didn't need as many people working in the box office if they have this instead. Um, you know, I was watching, um, you know, part of the interruption one time and they were saying robots are replaced line judges, right? Because if robots can do the job better than line judges, why do we need line judges? Right? You're going to see a lot of sports that's going to happen. You're going to see it probably with umpires in baseball, perhaps, right? You know, if, if umps keep missing a lot of, like, you know, clear balls and strikes and robots can do it easier, right? Like, you can see the robot thing on TV. Like, you know it's a ball or strike. You know, people are going to become unemployed. Um, you know, same with football, same with any sport. So here's, here's some examples of former students. Um, you know, cameras. Cameras generally replace security guards. Generally, when a firm gets more cameras, and I don't know if you guys know, but the school bought tons of cameras. The last time I went into school, when I was doing professional development like a few weeks ago, they were installing cameras left and right, okay? 
So I would imagine some red shirts are probably going to get laid off. So I mean, it sucks, right? I'm not like for that, but like that's generally what happens because you don't need as many eyes watching. Um, so security cameras definitely call structural unemployment in, uh, in you know in the security guard industry. Um, Again, this one, this one's off the internet, but it's a really good one. This is like, you know, like if I don't know, I, I never knew about it. Like, I love that. Like, you know, this used to be a job, uh, uh, the knocker upper. It sounds, sounds weird, but um, you'd walk around and you'd basically have like a journal, right, uh, of people that, like your clients, right, and you'd go around and they would tell you a certain time that they need to be woken up and you'd go to their house and you'd knock on the window and you'd wake them up. Right before the times of alarm clock, before the time you can set your your alarm clock on your, your phone. Right, obviously at some point that person lost their job, right? Because we have alarm clocks. Right, even the person that made the alarm clock looks like this probably lost their job because the iPhone. Structural unemployment just continually continuously happens all the time. Um, Krispy Kreme, right? Do you see any workers in this picture? No, I'm sure donuts at one point was made all handmade all the time. Now Krispy Kreme makes a lot of donuts just you know on the assembly line. You know if you go to the airport. There's a lot of self check-ins. Self check-ins anywhere are going to replace uh, workers. Structural unemployment. Uh, having an access card again replaces security guards. Security guards can get replaced in a lot of different ways, so you got to be aware of that, right? So you know, when I check, if whenever I get to the school super early, like at 6:30, I would have to use my my ID to get in, and that displaces a security guard having to check my credentials upon entry. Um, so you know, security guards lose their jobs generally when when that gets installed. Um, you know, news apps, right? Just like the iPhone itself has displaced a lot of workers. Do people get the newspaper anymore? A, a very, very small amount of people, right? I, I, I can guarantee you people working in the newspaper industry have lost their job as a result of digital print. Um, this one's pretty cool. This, again, this is an old one. It's off the internet. It's fine. Both these are. Uh, but it, it's so old that I didn't know this really existed. So I think it's pretty cool. Uh, lamp lighters, right? Obviously, they have to go out. They'd have a plan on, on who's got to light, you know, different, you know, street lights. Um, and, um, yeah, they would do it right before, uh, you know, the sunset. Now, obviously, everything's digital. Everything's automated. Those, those workers obviously lost their jobs at some point. You know, uh, the pin setters, right? So at bowling alleys back in the day, there wasn't automated. You had to have people reset your pins every time you knocked them down. Right? That was probably like unskilled labor, like high school kids or something like that. But, you know, obviously, all those workers don't work in that industry anymore. This kid was trying to take shots at me, but little does he know, I'm on the YouTube game now, right? Uh, but he was basically saying, like, this, this teacher's going to replace you because he teaches online. I don't know. I think my production looks a little better than that, right? I don't know. Traffic lights have replaced, you know, people directing traffic. Um, this person basically makes the argument that even surgeons might get replaced. And you're like, no way. Surgeons have the most human capital, like, you can ever think of, right? They go to school for years and years and years and years. And beyond that, get more and more experience. And like, they're incredibly scarce. However... Right? If some sort of surgery has like a 1% error with a surgeon, and if it's automated and like there's 0% chance of error, and like there's never been an error, right? Surgeons might get replaced, is, is the idea. Um, who needs good old bartenders when a robot serves, um, you know, beer for you, right? Um, in 90 seconds or less. I think if I'm going out to get a drink, I rather like, I, I want the experience of that. I don't want like a robot serving me a drink. And I'm talking about water, all right? Okay? Um, Next, right, again, like kiosk, right, like, like you know, Skittles Place is going to replace, you know, um, candy, you know, not candy restaurant, but like a candy shop. Um, the Pony Express got, obviously got replaced by like USPS. Um, uh, those that made the, uh, the, the, uh, the phone book got replaced, you know, again, by the iPhone. Um, some waiters and waitresses are getting replaced by like little kiosk at the tables. Uh, what is this? Fruit snacks. Again, another kiosk, another kiosk. Um, this one's pretty funny. I like this one. Who needs a, to hire a jester when you can just watch, like, you know, Dave Chappelle or someone else on Netflix, right? It's pretty crazy. People used to have a job of being, like, a comedian, right? Now, there's still comedians, but, like, there's not as many comedians because now, like, one comedian, you know, broadcasts to many, right? It's kind of what I'm saying with teaching, right? That, that could happen to teachers. Um, iTunes makes the uh, the market for traditional record scores. Yeah, yeah, it, it, traditional record stores are gone. Traditional book score, uh, book stores are gone. I'm almost there. Um, yeah, uh, today's trash day in my neighborhood, and when I see trash getting picked up, I generally see like one person. It used to be two. It used to have to be a person on the back. Now there's just like one guy doing it. Um, librarians, we're, we don't use librarians much anymore because uh, it's all automated. Sorting mail is now automated. Um, do you guys know this? The average time human contact 
interacts with your package from Amazon is, is less than 60, it's either 60 or 90 seconds. It's not that long at all. It's again, a really cool video. I need to, I need to, I need to, I have tons of videos I usually show and I can't. Um, but it's crazy. If you look in the, in the store of Amazon, there's not that many people. And Amazon's one of the biggest firms in, in all of the US and all of the world, obviously. But in terms of, of total revenue and amount of labor costs, their labor costs are extremely low for how much, for, for the size and, uh, of, the, of the economies of scale that that, that firm has. It's, it's crazy. Everything's robots, automated. It, it, it's absolutely insane. I'll, maybe I'll show you guys in Google Meet. Um, again, so yeah, there used to be like a mice catcher. You'd run around like a, a business and catch the, the mice. Now, like, you know, you just put cats there. Um, Tesla has an automated truck, so we might not have truckers anymore. Right, T tons of structural unemployment. It's gonna it's, it's gonna continue to happen all the time. So think about that when you go to college or trades or anything like that. Make sure you are, and you never know, right? Like I might you know lose my job due to structural unemployment. I didn't know that you know ten years ago. I didn't even know that last year. Um, but just know that you know at some point a lot of jobs could get replaced by automation. So make sure you're not working in an industry that that's susceptible uh, to that. Okay, the last one is let me get a time check. Pretty good. Is cyclical unemployment. We're almost done. Cyclical unemployment. Okay, hold on, real quick. Revisit. So, is frictional unemployment bad? Simply be, uh, you know, entering the labor force for the first time, quitting your job, you don't like it. No, that's healthy. That's fine. That's natural. Is structural unemployment bad? Structural unemployment is bad. Like if it happens to you, right? Obviously, you're going to be like upset. But if you're living in a country that is is producing a lot of automation to probably increase the standard of living, make your life easier. Um, that's just going to be some like bumps and bruises along the way, right? Structural employment, I would say, is natural. It's healthy, and if workers that are displaced due to automation doesn't really it doesn't really reflect poor economic health um, in, in a lot of ways. And obviously, if it's on a, a mass scale, where like all retail workers lose their jobs, which a lot of people say is probably going to happen like in ten years, that could be at some point unhealthy. But generally, like there's some level of structural employment, it's, it's fine. It's it's natural, right? We're advancing. We're 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 producing technology, right? Um, cool. Uh, so the last one is the unemployment that is bad. This is the unemployment that's not natural. This is the unemployment that we need to narrow on in uh, because this is the unemployment that actually is reflective of poor economic health. This is a specific unemployment that we want to find. It's cyclical unemployment. Cyclical unemployment basically is you are unemployed. The firm wants to have you on board. They want to they want to hire you hire you or or, or keep you. Um, but you can't get the job or you're laid off from your job because of cost. The firm can't afford you. That's the idea of cyclical unemployment. You lose your job generally because of demand deficient unemployment. You're losing your job because the amount of revenue has now subsided, right? The business used to be making X amount of dollars. Now they're, they're losing revenue, right? Sometimes teachers get laid off for that reason. Teachers get laid off when, when, when the economy is poor because uh, tax revenue, it falls short of, 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 of the amount that we need in order to, to you know, to run the school. Um, so yeah, cyclical unemployment rate in, in, in 2008 was 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 extra, extraordinarily high, right? People lost their jobs that were working jobs for 10, 15 years, um, it's just because um, you know they, they 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 can't afford to hire them any longer. Um, my uh, my my father-in-law sounds kind of sounds weird to say. My father-in-law lost his job at Ford. He worked there for 20 some years and, and he was, you know, project manager. He was up there, right? He, he was, you know, top of the line, but he lost his job due to the recent uh, tariffs of steel with China in the last couple of years. Um, and that is, I would argue, sickle unemployment. Ford had to talk to him like, hey, we love you. You know, like we can't hire you. We, we, we can't afford you. Like your salary is too much. And if we got to pay more for steel, we got to cut costs in certain areas. So I'm sorry, uh, you're out, right? That's the idea of sickle unemployment. You're unemployed because the firm can't hire you. So again, demand deficient unemployment, basically the idea that people stop spending as much money and when revenue falls short, um, firms cut costs in order to maintain profits and when firms lay you off to cut costs, that's obviously gonna cause more demand deficient unemployment because now you're, you have no income, so you're gonna stop buying things that you normally buy. Other workers are gonna get laid off, they stop buying things, it's kind of this, this vicious cycle downwards. So we don't want cyclical unemployment to happen because once that happens, it kind of spirals out of control. It's like my front yard. I keep having this like weird weed that keeps growing in my front yard and it's like a virus and I, I keep putting weed killer on it and it keeps spreading and spreading more, right? Once cyclical unemployment starts happening, it kind of ca causes this vicious cycle uh, downwards. Okay, almost there. One last concept and it'll be a quick concept and it's the most important concept of all this. 
So we, we, we've talked about three types of unemployment. <clears throat> we said two of them are natural, two of them are fine, and one of them is bad. Frictional and structural is, is natural. It's fine, unless it happens to you. And then cyclical is bad, obviously. So what we need to figure out is how do we calculate the cyclical unemployment rate? So if the Bureau of Labor Statistics says the unemployment rate in the United States is 7%, we need to figure out of that 7%, how much, what, what percent of that 7% is, is due to cyclical reasons, is cyclical unemployment. That's the idea. So what we need in order to identify that is something called the natural rate of unemployment. The natural rate of unemployment basically is in a healthy economy, what is the normal level of unemployment that a country is going to experience? And generally in our country, it's 5%. five percent. We're going to use 5% as our, as our, as our example always. It, 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 it fluctuates between 4 to 6%. But, but generally, it, it's 5%, just to, to make it easy. So what that means is, in a healthy economy, in the United States, again, understanding that unemployment generally is understated, right? Think about that at the same time. But generally, a healthy economy in the U.S. is going to be 5%. It's going to be 5%. Generally, if it's 5%, that's the total amount of people that are going to be unemployed due to structural reasons and frictional reasons. And at 5%, that means we have 0% cyclical unemployment, okay? So it says many people assume that our goal is 0% unemployment. No, it's not. We don't want 0% unemployment. If we get unemployment traditionally, and this is the argument of the Phillips curve, which the Phillips curve is sort of contested nowadays. We'll get more of that later. But macroeconomics 101, generally if unemployment goes below the natural rate of unemployment, unemployment is said to be too low. And when unemployment is said to be too low, it's less than 5% in a country, inflation starts to occur, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. And obviously we don't want inflation to occur. So the Federal Reserve, which... It's kind of like the Supreme Court now. It's like really like political now. It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be like independent. The Federal Reserve's job is, suppo is supposed to maintain 5% unemployment. Now the Federal Reserve's job is like make unemployment as low as humanly possible, right? It's not supposed to be like that. If unemployment gets too low, they're supposed to increase rates and slow the economy down to prevent inflation from occurring is the idea. So unemployment can get too low. But again, that's again that argument's contested as well because the Phillips curve hasn't really been true in the last 20 some years. We'll get more of that at a later date. But just know we, we want unemployment to be at 5%. And in this course, that's what you want. You want unemployment to be 5%. You don't want it to be lower, you don't want it to be higher. You want it to be really, really close to 5%. Okay? So the natural rate of unemployment is composed of frictional plus structural. That's what equals the natural rate of unemployment. So if the natural rate of un unemployment is 5%, that means that's, that's frictional, structural. And if the, unemployment, the natural rate of unemployment is 5%, that means the cyclical unemployment rate is zero. That means we have no one unemployed due to a downturn in the economy. So yeah, natural uh, unemployment rate is frictional plus structural. That's the amount of unemployment that's gonna exist if the economy is healthy. So again, the US is 5%. Between four to 6%, it's, it's 5%. Um, also another vocab word for you is called full employment output. Full employment, I usually won't say output, I think I'll just say full employment. Full employment is the idea that this is how much GDP, this is the level of output, GDP is output, real GDP is output more specifically. This is how much stuff we're gonna produce of value if we're operating at the natural rate of unemployment. If we're operating at unemployment rate of 5%, this is how much stuff we, we should be able to produce of, of market value, okay? That's what full employment means. And that's gonna be very important when you guys come back to class, when we start graphing the economy using the ADAS model, okay? Natural rate of unemployment is frictional plus structural, and it's 5% in this country. And then the full employment output is how much stuff can we produce if we're operating at that unemployment rate, at the unemployment rate of 5%. So the last thing we need to talk about is, 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 is say this, right? Say the unemployment rate is 8%. The, the U.S. unemployment rate is 8%. And also given the information that the U.S. natural rate of unemployment is 5%, if the natural rate of unemployment is 5%, and the total unemployment rate is 8%, what is the cyclical unemployment rate? Of that 8%, how many people are unemployed due to poor reasons, right? Due, due to reasons of a bad economy. Due to reasons of people that are not spending money, so revenue is falling short and people are getting laid off. If the natural rate is 5%, that's the healthy economy, that's frictional plus structural. The total unemployment rate, frictional plus structural plus cyclical, is 8%. The cyclical unemployment rate would be 3%. Does that make sense? That's why we have to. That's why we have to know the natural rate of unemployment. We have to know what is the, the, the healthy percent of unemployment, five percent. What is the total unemployment rate, eight percent? If we know that natural rate is frictional plus structural, right? And the total unemployment rates, all three of them added together to isolate and identify 
cyclical unemployment rate, you just subtract the unemployment rate minus the natural rate of unemployment. So if it's 8%, minus 5%, it'd be 3%. Hope you guys are tracking on that. Um, okay, I got, I got two more slides, right? Two more slides, really important. So it says the natural rate of unemployment um, is, is sometimes higher in other countries. The biggest thing is this. You have to be able to uh, answer questions on changes to the natural rate of unemployment. So what if I said this, and this is the most common one, the most uh, the common one you're going to see, is workers' compensation. You guys know what workers' compensation is or, or um, unemployment compensation more so? Generally, if you lose your job in the U.S. and um, if the conditions are, are met, right, the criteria is met, you can collect unemployment compensation, right? Like if I lose my job teaching, I can collect unemployment compensation for a few months. The whole point of having unemployment compensation in the country is, is, is to prevent that um, vicious cycle downwards. It's called, an, it's called an automatic stabilizer, right? So in times of COVID, right, instead of like Congress having to get together and, and pass a bill to, to get people money really quickly, if everyone can collect unemployment compensation, it's gonna mitigate the fall into a recession. If I lose my job due to typical unemployment, right, I can collect unemployment, you know, in order to keep me on my feet enough to find myself another job somewhere else. That's the idea. So that's what unemployment compensation is. If the if the, you need to know this, if the country increases unemployment benefits, if the country impl uh, increases unemployment compensation, what would happen to the natural rate of unemployment? If the, if, if the country says, uh, instead of unemployment compensation being three months, it's now going to be six months, right? That's going to prolong your job search, right? If I lost my job teaching and I, got, I get unemployment benefits for three months, and now instead of three months, it's six months, you better believe I'm going to take six months to find a job. I'm not going to try to find a job in three months. I'm going to try to find a job pretty quick, but, you know, I'm not going to just, like, take, you know, I'm not going to work at McDonald's, you know, off the bat. I'm going to, like, take my full six months and try to find that right fit. So... When, when unemployment compensation increases, the natural rate of unemployment will increase because frictional unemployment will increase. People will prolong their jobs or they'll be between jobs longer. So when unemployment compensation increases, frictional unemployment will increase, thus increasing natural rate of unemployment, and obviously vice versa. If the government decreases unemployment compensation, people uh, you know get uh, unemployment compensation reduced from three months to like a month. If that happened to me, you better believe I'm gonna try to find the first job I can get. Yeah, I might work at McDonald's for a week. Right, so that's gonna that's gonna lower you know, like not prolong the job search. Um, so that's gonna lower frictional unemployment, thus reducing the net rate of unemployment. You need to know changes to the uh, net rate of unemployment and how they would occur. In Europe, generally unemployment benefits are, are really good. Generally, it's really hard to get fired in a lot of European countries. So people aren't uh, they don't have the frictional unemployment um, uh, that we have. Okay, okay. Um, so so what that also means is 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 businesses are more reluctant to hire. So, so generally, people are unemployed a little bit longer. Um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so the last slide is criticisms on the unemployment rate. We talked about problems with GDP, right? We said GDP measures a lot of things that are harmful, right, that are bad, and we need to understand that and know that GDP is not a perfect measure of society, right? Nor is unemployment, nor is inflation uh, that we're going to learn about tomorrow. The, the biggest problems with the unemployment rate is, one, it does not count discouraged workers, that's generally why the unemployment rate is understated. You know, it could be a really bad economy and people are trying to find work and they can't find work so they give up looking for work, right? And they start, you know, doing illegal activity or I don't know, right? You know, the unemployment rate might be really low. It's 5%. We're doing great, people. Well, is it really good, right? Is it really reflective of poor economic or, or good economic health if a lot of people are not counted as unemployed because they're discouraged, right? So uh, that's one problem with, with the unemployment rate you need to be aware of. The second um, part is underemployed workers. Say you're working part-time, right? Like, like say you graduate from college and you have like an engineering degree, right? And you can't find an engineering job. The economy is not doing well. And in order to make ends meet, you take up a job as a bartender somewhere, right? And since you're working as a bartender, you are counted as employed. You're not unemployed. Even though you have like way beyond, you know, not saying bartenders like don't have a lot of, like some bartenders are pretty crazy and like they're irreplaceable, but um, you know, you are well qualified beyond that, right? You're an engineer and you took many years of, of, you know, education experience to become an engineer and you can't find a job as an engineer because you're working as a bartender, 
So the economy, the unemployment rate would be really low, but really, is the economy good? No, because people are underemployed. It doesn't count part-time workers. Say, say uh, you know, you're an engineer and you get your hours reduced from 40 hours to like 20 hours, right? You probably work more than that, but um, you're still employed, right? But are you happy? Is that a good economy that they can't afford to keep you full-time? No, right? So some people are working part-time. Some people are working jobs that they're, they're overqualified for. Like, think about if you're like a teaching, uh, you have a teaching degree and you're a teacher, you can't find a job as a teacher, you're a sub, right? A substitute teacher. You're not unemployed and you're employed, but is that, is that a good economy to be a part of? No, that's not. And the last one is race and age inequalities. Unemployment rates um, are, you know, if you see the unemployment rate is 6% in the U.S., you're like, well, you know, the unemployment rate's like not too bad, right? There's only 1% one circle unemployment rate. The unemployment rate might be higher among minorities, right? You know, black Americans, um, you know, uh, males versus females, um, you know, uh, it might be higher among elderly, it might be higher uh, among, you know, the youth, right? Um, those that are over 16. So it doesn't really reflect a, a healthy economy if there's a lot of discrimination, right? A lot of people get discriminated upon, you know, based on their name on a resume or again, based on the color of their skin or, or et cetera, right? So if the unemployment rate is 5%, you know, like, oh, what a great country to live in. Well, if there's higher unemployment rates among certain types of people opposed to other types of people, obviously that's not a, a good economy uh, that, that, that we want to live in, obviously. So those are the problems with the unemployment rate. All right, I, th I think that's it. Okay, again, people, when you, if you look at the notes that I post, there's a lot of multiple choice questions. I would, I would encourage you to look at those. We just generally don't have a lot of time in this setting. So yeah, Mr. Moore said a short PowerPoint went 56 minutes long. What is that? All right, people, I know I took your whole hour. And it sucks because now I'm not going to be able to see you in Google Meet. Um, so if, if you're good to go um, and you're good to go on the problem set and, you know, go ahead, start, you know, knocking out that unit one test, go for it. Um, you know, I don't need to see you in Google Meet here in a couple of minutes. If you want to hang out uh, in Google Meet and, you know, ask me questions, you can't ask me questions about the test. All right. You can't in front of everybody. Don't don't just like email me or Jupiter message me if you have uh, any questions about the test. Uh, but, yeah, if you want to hang out, do the problem set. Or just like hang out and like do your test and I ask questions about it. Or hang out and celebrate Sophie's birthday, right? Hop into the Google Meet. Take a break if you need it. But I'll be in Google Meet. Thank you for staying tuned. Our last day is tomorrow, people. I'll make sure we have time tomorrow to hang out, okay? Within the, within the, within the, uh, the one, one hour time, okay? I'll see you guys in Google Meet or I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for, uh, for tuning into the live stream.